Out of Order Gun Rights Podcast, Episode 27. Welcome to the Out of Order Podcast, your window into the firearms community, exploring those shaping the future of our rights and protecting our lifestyle, laws, legal cases, activism, and self-defense in a candid and honest podcast for our brothers and sisters in arms. Here's your host, James Kalita. Thanks for tuning in to the Out of Order Gun Rights Podcast. Today's show notes page will be outoforderjamescalita.com forward slash 27. And today's guest is Jay Factor. Uh, this is episode two with Jay, and we're going to have one more tomorrow uh, talking about the history of New Jersey firearms law, how the original intent was completely changed and corrupted without uh, following the proper process. Uh, So if you head over to the show notes page, you'll find links to our sponsors, place where you could sign up for the email list and uh, links to Jay. And now here's Jay Factor. So you mentioned Berinsky, Sicardi, and Priest. Uh, Could you maybe go through those? And so Sicardi is really the mother of the mother of all is wrong in the state. Okay. So we're in 1971. What happened? What happened when when Sills, Attorney General Arthur Sills sold sold the gun control law in 1966? He sold it that if you if you were one of the good guys, you'll be able to get a permit to purchase and carry. That's how he sold it in the papers. I got 20 clips from newspapers from 1964, five and six, where he's quoted as saying that. I can't tell you exactly what it was, and my. Theories. I've got two separate theories. Both of them hold a lot of water. Both of them have a lot of evidence to support them. But I don't really have a smoking gun on either of them. But I have to tell you like a background story. So 1964, the Democratic National Convention is in Atlantic City. The Mississippi Democrats will not recognize the black contingent from Mississippi called the Mississippi Freedmen's Bureau they actually win their district, but Mississippi says you can't come to Atlantic City. We're not going to give you seats. You don't get the vote, I guess, on uh, who's going to become president, right? That's what they're doing. Hmm. Right. Okay. So the Mississippi freedmen, now uh, there's all black guys. And remember, this is in 1964. It's not like it is today where, you know, black guys can do whatever they want. 1964 wasn't quite like that. Anyway, these guys all get on a bus or buses, go to Atlantic City, and they stand out. They stand out um, in front of the convention hall or wherever this thing's being held in Atlantic City, and they protest it. And uh, Sills and the state police are worried. They don't have enough manpower to cover this thing. And their internal memos and letters, and they're really, really worried about a race riot. If you talk to the old timers, and I'm talking about guys who are 80 something years old now guys who were policemen back in the day um i've had this conversation with cheeseman and his father remembers this they thought it was going to be the biggest race riot ever and it was going to be doom and gloom and they were calling policemen out from all over and they were really really worried about the black guys now very interesting these guys just wanted to be seated in a political environment they they actually won the district and they just wanted to sit down and they were all when all things were said and done, it was, it was peaceful. I'm sure it didn't look peaceful to have all those guys protesting, but they didn't do anything wrong. Anyway, Sills was always, always very worried in the superintendent of state police that we were going to have a black uprising. My personal belief is that when Sills set forward to put A-165 together, which we now know as our gun control law, he believed in the Second Amendment and thought you had a right to bear arms. And then a couple, he got involved with Dodd in the Dodd hearings in the 1968 gun, federal gun control hearings and gotten in, in, in with some of the attorney generals of the United States. And they started to steer him into this new collegiate theory that the Second Amendment was a collective right and, and it wasn't an individual right. But that all happened 
just after just after our gun control law gets passed. Anyway, when Sills fights when Sills fights to save the the gun control law in 1968 in Burton, he's the attorney general. All of a sudden, he changes course, and now the statute in Northampton applies. It's not a it's not an it's not a uh, absolute right to carry guns. Um, the language of the Second Amendment shows that it's a collective right, and they actually said in Burton that the militia of the Second Amendment today is the National Guard. I think it's – as any student of the subject knows, the militia of <laughs> the Second Amendment is now the National Guard, which to you and me who – I mean you don't have to be, you don't have to be a, a history major to know that's, that's absolutely wrong, right? You just need to take right. fourth grade history class to know there's no way the militia of the Second Amendment is appended to the standing army. It's just, it just can't be true. Right. But yep. when they win that case – they now have a carte blanche to do whatever they want because basically the New Jersey Supreme Court has said there is no individual right. It's a collective right, which is odd that they never stopped 2C58-3 permits. I just went after 2C58-4 permits, and which is why I think there might be something more than disarming the blacks involved in, in where I'm going with this. I also think there's another plausible theory here that let – me, let, me, let me give you an explanation. I live – I live in an area where uh, a lot of rich ex-rock and rollers live, <laughs> and all the rich ex-rock and rollers have what you and I would consider a house on their property that is really a guard station, and there are two or three guards in that guard station on three shifts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they all make $400, $500 for doing their shift. Wow. Yeah. The security game is a lot of money. Certainly at the time, it was a lot of money. So if you control who carries the guns, you basically control the security game, right? You control who's yeah. getting the jobs. So if you're on the New Jersey Police Chiefs Association and you only want your members to get the security jobs, what's the easiest way to make sure that you need to hire an off-duty police officer is to – Outlaw 2C58-4 permits. I think that had a lot to do with it myself. I think okay. I think both of them work together. Myself, I think there's. I don't think you could put your finger on one or the other. I think it's both of them at the time. And anyway, there's nothing in 1968 in the New Jersey Register, which basically the New Jersey Register is if you want to make a new administrative code, a new rule. You have to enter it into the New Jersey Register, and that's that page that we were just talking about that she's been put up on Firearm Syndicate is from the register that, you know, we've got a proposal that we're going to put urgent necessity back into the code. And it never left the code, but they have to do it. Anyway, so if you look in the New Jersey Register and then you look in uh, – then you look in the administrative code back in 1968, 1969, 1970, 1971. We can go all the way up to 1991. There is no, there is no adherence to the Administrative Procedures Act where we're going we're gonna to put this new Sicardi, we're going to put this rule in place. There is no rule of urgent necessity. There is no rule of pre, uh, surviving previous attacks, plural. There is no rule of previous documented threats, plural. There is, only, uh, there is only the word need, and basically need was being addressed exactly the same as your shooting qualification. And need at the time, the way Sills sold it and the way it was, 1968, 1969, 1970, 1971, would go all the way to 79 before they threw justifiable need into the statute. Need was being evaluated just like the shooting course. Basically, need was just was your need lawful, right? Mm -hmm. The way the reason that the reason Sills, what a lot of people don't know, why Sills changed concealed carry to all carry in New Jersey prior to '66, you put on a holster and carried openly, you could carry, and they couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't arrest you. Nothing. There was there was a loophole in 66 because up until 1968 you didn't need serial numbers on guns so if sills makes this law that you have to get a 2c58-3 permit to purchase 
and all of a sudden you got these criminals that are carrying around pre-1968 guns, there's no way to prove that they that they weren't legally purchased prior to the law. And there's also no way to prevent, and, and I have the documentation on all of this, uh, guns coming in from Maryland or mail order guns. Sills, Sills went and testified before uh, the Senate and the House representatives, the federal, and from 65 to 68, and basically sold our gun control law to Dodd as the basis for the 1968 omnibus bill that became the Federal Gun Control Act. But still gives a story about a guy from Newark that uh, went to Maryland and bought, I don't know, 140 handguns and brought them back to Newark and sold them in Newark. And they were running an operation with some of the Maryland gun dealers and that, that they tracked they track these guns down. And that's how they knew that straw purchasers were going out of state to buy guns. So how does remember, these guns don't have serial numbers on them. How does, how does Sills prevent a pre-1960 a pre-1968 no serial number gun, a mail order gun, or a gun that was bought in Maryland and brought here illegally, uh, how does he prevent that from from getting into New Jersey? He doesn't. But what he can do, because he now has the, the 2C58-3 permit on everything, if he changes the carry law from concealed to all forms of carry, you, need, you now need a license for everything, right? So if you're a criminal... And you're open carrying a gun you got from Maryland, doesn't matter. You had to get a permit, and the whole reason he wanted you to get a permit was so you would pass the background checks, the same background checks in 2C58-3 that you had to pass to get a permit to purchase in your FID card. This way, he's got fingerprints and background checks on every single gun. It was brilliant. It was a brilliant move. And people were, people were angry about it. And he said, look, as long as you meet the qualifications, it's standards, use standards, as long as you meet the standards, you can still get a permit to carry. This is the only way I know to get a background check and fingerprints on every single gun in the state of New Jersey. He says it. That so, might be an H.R. 510 at the House of Representatives in conjunction with the A-165 debates. I put those two together, but he, he said it, and it's on paper. So he, so for people outside New Jersey, our, our administrative code is the – Sort of the explanation of the laws and the instructions for the police on how to enforce them is that yeah yeah okay. they, they take so, the statute and they apply all the miscellaneous rules to the statute so so the law went into effect 1966 and from 1966 to 1979 there was no justifiable need and no there was need not was justifiable need. justifiable was put in in 79 oh, okay and so and they did and that they, without, and it didn't mean so, anything they just put it in there. And quite frankly, I think that's the only thing that's saving, that's saving 2C58-4 from, from Heller today is justifiable. It was just need. The law will be completely illegal. And I'll explain that later. Keep going. Oh, so, and they did that without any, any vote or any, you know, without it going through uh, you know, the, the state house or the state senate. Again, they just changed the administrative code, basically changing the law without okay, passing so, a new one. Here's what's happened. Let's go back to 19... It's, I, know, I know in late 69, because there's a court case, uh, Newman, Richard Newman was a pharmacist, had a carry permit. He got his carry permit for late night deposits in the local bank because he carried, because he carried narcotics or had narcotics on the premises. Well, well, late night deposits at the bank is the exact reason Sicardi was denied. But in 69, Newman had a permit from 1961 to 1969 specifically for that reason, which means after the gun control law took effect from 66 to 69, they're still handing out permits for cash deposits at night. There's, there's another case called Riley. Riley is uh, three or four doctors out of Newark who had all had permits from 1960 to 1969. Their 1970 permits were denied. They say... The one doctor carried cash. The one doctor, the one, the one doctor uh, worked late at night in in a bad neighborhood. The one doctor uh, carried pharmaceuticals in his bag when he made house calls. Those were all legitimate reasons to get a carry permit up until 1970. So if you read the administrative code, you have to read this thing in harmony with the New Jersey record. You got to go to the record just before the code comes out and see. Where where does the state 
put put this proposal in writing in the record so it can meet the Administrative Procedures Act. Because if you read 2C58-2.6, any rule, any rule for 2C58-3 or 4 has to meet the Administrative Procedures Act. There is nothing in the in the record. I'm sorry, the register. So you go, you got to go back now and, and and go. Well, where did this thing come from? Because you can't find the change in the code until 1991. So how is it that Sicardi comes out in 1971, and there's nothing in the administrative code that says urgent necessity, previous attacks, uh, previous threats, right? Which is the standard. Yeah. Well, when you so, read Sergeant, what you got to read Sergeant Klaus's testimony in Sicardi. Sergeant Klaus was from the investigation unit of the state police. Bizarre. You know, it is a, you know Sicardi's a test case because there's five police chiefs from five different other towns. The Shrewsbury police chief, who's the head of the police chiefs association from New Jersey, is there. And they bring Sergeant Klaus, the sergeant from the investigation unit of the state police, right? So the entire weight of government against this guy who owns a movie theater who didn't have a very good Second Amendment lawyer. And Sergeant Klaus says, we think need and necessity go hand in hand. And unless you absolutely need it, we're, we're not handing out the permit. Our standards of needs are changing to more stringency. That's what he said. Our standards of need are changing. Go and read the, the police the testimony. What's that? That was Sergeant Klaus that said that? Sergeant Klaus says that. Go read the police chief testimony. You've got Chief Roy from Plainfield. you got the Cranford police chief. you got the Westfield police chief. And uh, I think the other one might be the Elizabeth police chief. One or, one or two of them say our standards are changing to the side of more stringency. All, so you got three guys in court. I think the Supreme Court in New Jersey knows, oh, my God. The state police just can't make a rule and not put it in the New Jersey record. The state police, they violated the Administrative Procedures Act by making this rule. This thing doesn't even exist. This is just an internal policy of the state police investigation unit. So they come up with this scheme, is what it is, that there's a rule of assignment judges. But – when they write it in Sicardi, it says the assignment judges further a strict policy. Well, the strict policy they're furthering is the state police policy from Sergeant Klaus. The assignment judges pick it up and they write it as a. They, I don't know. I don't know that they actually do write it. They they say that the assignment judges have a, have this policy that you can't get a. You can't qualify for a permit unless you have urgent necessity, which is. In the case of a private citizen surviving previous attacks and previous threats, right? So I have searched. Listen, I'm standing right right in front of me. I have I have uh, all of New Jersey court rules. It's 3,800 pages. There is no there is no rule from the assignment judges in there. Like just so you're aware of what these rules would be like, there's a rule that came out in 1967 from the attorney general that says anytime, anytime the police chief, the state police or the court are notified of a 2C58-4 um, appeal to notify the attorney general's office so they can get to the prosecutor's office and assign a prosecutor to represent the state in this case. That's not written in the statute that a prosecutor has to show up. The original rule was it was an informal hearing. Now all of a sudden you got a prosecutor up your ass screaming, I object to every single thing you say. Well, that comes from a, that comes from a written rule. There's, it actually exists from 1967. It has a number. It exists in a file. You can find it in the Freedom of Information Act request. I have it. But you can't find the assignment judge's rule anywhere because it doesn't exist. They made it up to cover the state police. But then when the Supreme Court takes it, now you got this guy, uh, this guy uh, Justice Jacobs, who, who wrote Sicardi. He's just he's just as anti-gun as you could possibly be. Says that we think the best definition, we think we think the definition 
of need in the in the statute is is best described by the assignment judges that you have to have urgent necessity, you have to survive previous attacks, you you have to have previous documented threats with the police department. So once the Supreme Court takes it and says that, it's now Supreme Court precedent. So that's how that's why Sicardi is the mother of this whole thing. So the you mentioned the record and then there was the the, the administrative code. That's the guidelines people or the, the police use to interpret the law. What is what is the record? Before you, you make before you make an administrative code, if you have a proposed rule change, you have to open it for public debate. Oh, you, I see. To follow the Administrative Procedures Act, you have to print it in the record that you are going to change the rules the way they are to what they're going to be and give the previous rule, the new rule, and why the changes are needed, how much they're going to cost the state government, how much they cost the federal government, the impact, the impact on the Constitution, and the impact on the people, stuff like that. Right. So we're in 1971. Don't you think – that the administrative code, once Sicardi comes out and says there's a Sicardi rule, that the administrative code would change, that someone would add the Sicardi rule to the code, right? Yes. It, yeah. It's logical. Yep. It's not in the code until 1991. And you know how it gets in the code? There's another case, Drew Priest and Gary Klein in Reed Priest, that, that really holds more water than Sicardi right now. And, and Priest saves us because Priest is the one that makes the Sicardi rule decided on a case by case basis, which we'll get into. But um, Priest, get, Priest, Gary Priest, uh, and Drew Klein are private detectives. I think one of them is a security guard. One's a private detective. One of them might be a bondsman. Anyway, they they reapply to get their permits and they shoot them down. The reason they shoot them down is because back in 65 or 62, 63, whatever, they took automatic carry permits for private detectives out of the law. And there was a reason for that, but it wasn't so private detectives didn't get carry permits. It was the reason they took it out of the law was what was happening back then is if you owned the private detective agency, you would make a corporation and have a, a first vice president, a second vice president, a treasurer. And because they were cor members of the corporation, you could give them all carry permits from your office, just write them up give them a gun and send them out on a job. So there weren't actually being, there were no background checks on those guys. Mm -hmm. And 1963, Johnson from Johnson and Johnson, that the, the son was the vice president, super, super wealthy guy was in a divorce battle and he hired some private investigators and they broke into Mrs. Johnson's house in the middle of the night. And Mrs. Johnson had a gun, and there was some shooting, and one of the detectives got shot, jumped out the second floor window, and there was some shooting on the front lawn, and the police were called, and Sills was called down, and it was all over the papers, and they said, this has to stop. Private detectives can't just be going into people's house, guns blazing. And so they took the automatic gun permits for private detectives out of the law, but Sills was very, very specific in the A165 debates when he explained why he did it. And I'll give you page numbers in case you ever want to go back and read it. It's 66A, which is the afternoon session, 67A, and 68A. It still is explained. Listen, I'm not saying private detectives shouldn't have carry permits. By all means, if you pass the qualifications to be a state police qualifications to be a private detective, then you'll pass the qualifications for a carry permit. I just need to make sure that everybody who carries a gun has a background check and fingerprints done on them. So – Sills wasn't broadly disqual disqualifying private detectives because he took that – that it was paragraph J out of the statute at the time. All he wanted was that everybody – so um, you, me, the retired police officer, and private detectives, and, and quite frankly criminals was who he was worried about, to go get fingerprinted and background checked so they could – they know who had a gun and who was carrying a gun. And that was the only reason. Anyway, Priest, Priest has Priest oblivious to this. Priest also has bad lawyers. Nobody knows about the A165 debate. And Justice O'Hearn and Priest says, well, that because they took that out, that means that they didn't want private detectives to have carry permits. So we're going to stick to the chorus of clarity that they don't have urgent necessity. They've never been attacked. 
and they don't have any written threats, so they, they don't get guns either. The law department, this is important, the law department will remain open to decide 2C58-4 permits on a case-by-case basis. That's super important. So anyway, let's get back to the code quickly. 1991, the administrative code comes out, not the register, just the code, makes an adjustment and changes in 2C, I'm sorry, in NJAC 1354-2.4D-1. They add the Sicardi rule to the code. 1991, 20 years after Sicardi. And they say they don't have to they don't have to go through the Administrative Procedures Act because it's a rule of the Supreme Court in in Sicardi. And it ends up in the code in ninety one. So basically what happened is state police make a bogus rule. The prosecutors in the Sicardi case and the judges in the Sicardi case know it's a bogus rule, so they come up with a scheme where they're going to have the administrative um, – the uh, assignment judges are going to take that rule and make it an assignment judge's rule because they don't think anybody's ever going to be able to track down an internal court policy like this. And then they make it Supreme Court precedent in Sicardi, and then Priest pulls it up and says that that's, that's the rule, and now it's Supreme Court rule in New Jersey, and they throw it into the code. So basically, we got backdoored by the investigation unit of the state police who screwed us in conjunction with the Attorney General's office and the su- Supreme Court in New Jersey. And that's where we are today. Berinsky wow. just takes, yeah, right? It's amazing. People don't know this. This is amazing. I mean, and listen, this, didn't, this wasn't an epiphany that happened because I read two cases. This is, this is reading every single case a hundred times and going back and checking every, every note that there is. But that's what happened. We got backdoored. It's an illegal rule. Never passed the Administrative Procedures Act in uh, 69, 70, or 71, which means when, when, as soon as Sergeant Klaus said it, it was illegal. He was never allowed to make a stricter rule. So, yeah, I don't think people – like, this must have been an incredible amount of work for you because – I, I know you didn't find it on Google because I looked on Google. <laughs> like trying I to went just... to uh, I went to Trenton to the library. I don't know, sixty times. I spent oh, a yeah. lot of time in Rutgers, uh, the Rutgers library in the basement, the special archives section. Uh, a lot of times with these old books, you're not even allowed to take pictures of them. You got to get in there with white gloves and a pencil and a pad and, and hand transcribe them to get stuff out of them. But yeah, but listen. Again, let's go back to let's go back to 2006. I had a 24 year old kid sitting behind the counter with a three inch bulletproof window, tell, asking me, "What do I need a carry permit for?" Right. I, yeah. I'm 40 years old. <laughs> Government's taking 33 percent of my money for taxes. What do you mean? What do I need a permit for? It's none of your fucking business. What I need a permit for? Right. Right. You you think you think Sam Adams would have would have answered that question? Would have said? Would have been polite? You think James Madison would have been polite? <laughs> think William nope. Patterson would? No, nope. absolutely not. Especially not Sam Adams. Yeah. Especially uh. not Sam Adams. <laughs> right. Sam Adams uh. is very. Sam Adams is very important for us. Nope. Sam Adams. He's super important for us. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Out of Order Gun Rights Podcast. Please head over to the show notes page, outofordersjamescalita.com forward slash 27. Make sure to sign up for our email list and check back tomorrow for part three of this interview with Jay Factor.